This video is an introduction to benefit cost analysis. The transportation planning model tells us flows and travel time on all the links of the network. We can do this for many different scenarios. When we talked about the rational planning framework in an earlier video, the idea was to compare alternatives. One of the alternatives might be a no-build alternative. In fact, the law requires that for environmental analysis of transportation projects, one of the alternatives that you compare is a no-build alternative. And there might be several different build alternatives. We build here or we build there, and then we want to see which of those is better. Benefit cost analysis is one way of assessing that. We need to figure out what the alternatives we were going to consider compared to the base case, typically the no-build case. We then want to identify the, and measure the benefits and costs of each alternative. We want to value each of the impacts. For instance, if we know what the travel speed difference is, we need to know what the value of time saving is. If alternative A saves 10 minutes compared to a baseline alternative, how much is 10 minutes worth per person, and then how many people is that going to benefit? Then we need to sum all of the benefits and the costs, compute a net present value, or NPV, compute benefit cost ratios, and rank them by benefit cost ratio. Note that if you rank things by net present value and you rank things by benefit cost ratio, you might come up with different answers. The idea of net present value is to take the future stream of benefits and value it in present day dollars, and the future stream of costs and value that in present day dollars. And the net present value is the difference between the present value of all the future benefits and the present value of all the future costs. So how do we get a present value of something in the future? How much is a dollar worth to you today? One dollar. And how much would you give me if I told you that I would give you a dollar next year? Less than a dollar because of factors like inflation and risk, which include the possibility that I might not pay it, pay it back, and so on. If you were to guarantee that my promise of a dollar to you next year would be paid back, then we would have to worry about inflation, but you wouldn't have to worry that I would just keep the dollar. But there's an alternative use of the money, and it depends on the risk. So, what are the benefits of a transportation project? Pause the video and think through the benefits of a transportation project. It could be that you make profits from it. How would you make profits from a transportation project? Well, as a construction firm, you might make money. If you charge tolls, you might make money. So if you're building a toll road and people are willing to pay you more than it costs to build and operate, then you have more revenue than your cost, and that's profit. So that's one way of measuring benefits. Most projects we build aren't toll roads. Most transit projects don't even cover their operating costs. Many road projects could cover their operating cost if we associated the gas tax revenue generated by users with that particular project, but we don't actually do that. So why do we do these things, like building transportation projects? Well, we try to save time for people and goods. The question is, how much is that time savings worth? And how many people does that time savings accrue to? That's a major benefit. Increase in safety is probably the second most important benefit that we'll be dealing with. You could have other reductions in externalities. If a project could somehow reduce pollution, that might be considered a benefit. Or if it resulted in the pollution being farther away from people, that could be an improvement as well. We might measure some changes in tax revenue. If we make businesses more productive, they pay more taxes. Income taxes, taxes on labor, sales taxes, and so on. But taxes are only a fraction of the benefits. Second, taxes are a transfer. Taxes take money from one pocket and put it into another pocket, assuming they don't have any effect on behavior. Often, they do have an effect on behavior, though. But the main effect is just transferring money from one party to another so that it's not a benefit to society, it's a benefit to the pocket that receives, and a disbenefit to the pocket that pays. In exchange, society presumably does something with that revenue that benefits the people who pay, but taxes are not generally considered benefits. Benefit cost analysis is both a science and an art. We need to make sure that we avoid double counting. We talked about taxes as being a transfer, not really a benefit. Now, it's a benefit to one party and a cost to another, but societally, socially, overall, it's a transfer. Insurance is a transfer. Imagine you are a driver and belong to a mutual insurance company. They are a nonprofit overall, so you pay money to them, and most years, if you don't have a crash, you're out of pocket, and they collect more money. But some years, you do have a crash, and you get more money back than you paid to them. Over all time, across all people, it nets out to approximately zero. So insurance itself is not a benefit or a cost. It's a transfer. Highway crashes, now that's a cost. Nobody benefits from the highway crash directly, nor in the medical and auto body industries, so we need to be careful to avoid double counting. 
The cost of fuel consumption would be another cost that's important. The cost of travel time would be important. The cost of pollution would be important. When we're doing the analysis, we want to identify who incurs the benefits and who incurs the costs. And so we have costs that are incurred by an agency. That's typically what the agency is going to think about. Costs which are incurred by society at large. This will include things like social externalities, like pollution, and costs which are incurred by the individual. Similarly, benefits can be incurred by individuals, agencies, or society as a whole. We mentioned the interest rate problem. A fancy name for this is the social rate of time preference. There are many different ways of looking at this. There are government interest rates you could use. There are the opportunity cost of capital. If you had $10 billion, what could you do with it? And again, this depends on the risk. The riskier the investment, the higher the rate of return that is offered. What the market is doing is equilibrating the proffered 10% gain times the probability of actually getting the 10% versus an alternative 2% gain times the probability of getting the 2% gain. So in general, lower risk investments have lower interest rates. If you were to do this in a repeated experiment some number of times, you should get the same rate of return whether you invest in high risk, high reward investments or low risk, low reward investments. Lots of people believe they are smarter than the market and they'll try to invest in one of these to try to get a higher rate of return. On average, collectively, we cannot all be smarter than the market. Individuals, of course, might be randomly higher or lower, and they will accredit that to their intelligence rather than randomness, but it's the same problem. You can look at the cost of funds. This is closer to what government actually does. How much would the government have to pay in terms of interest rates on its bonds in order to finance whatever it wants to do? And you can look at different governments that have different rates of return. There are lots of issues with this. The good thing about it is that most governments have a fairly high rating. Standard & Poor's, for instance, indicates that people have a high confidence that governments will repay the interest. The U.S. credit rating is AA now. Minnesota is AAA. That's higher than most corporations. The relevant question is, what are they backing this with? So if you have a toll road project and you're backing your bonds with the expected revenue from the toll road, you're going to pay a much higher interest rate than if you're the Minnesota State Department of Transportation back in your bonds with the full faith and credit of the state of Minnesota. A single toll road project is much riskier than the entire state of Minnesota. So then the question is, what's our evaluation criterion? Discounted present value of the benefits is higher than discounted present value of the costs, or the benefit cost ratio must be greater than one. Some people look at the net benefit to cost ratio, which is benefits minus costs divided by costs, and that must be greater than zero. But you don't get the same value if you rank net present value instead of benefit cost ratio. A big project is always going to have a higher net present value than a small project, but a small project might have a higher benefit cost ratio. And if it has a higher benefit cost ratio, essentially that means it has a higher rate of return, and that's, the, and that's what you want to do.